Wilbanks, uh, who's the Chief Commons Officer at Sage Bionetworks. Um, John's got a, a long history. Yeah, he was part of the, um, he was one of the, the early board members of the Transmark Foundation. Um, and, um, and so has, has certainly been uh, aware of the foundation and the things that we're doing. Um, he serves as the Chief Commons Officer at Sage Bionetworks. Uh, and has been uh, very active in uh, the data sharing Creative Commons uh, community. And we are delighted to have him here today to, to talk about um, sharing data, uh, especially in the times of a pandemic. Uh, John. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, sorry for that. I wanted to get this right before I got going. Uh, so uh, first, you know, thank you to uh, to Zach, to to Rudy, to the all the organizers, um, and Transmart and I2B2 for the chance to be here. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not together in person in Boston today. I would have very much liked to have seen you in person. Uh, so uh, Rudy mentioned in his kind intro, uh, I work at Sage Bio Networks, we're a nonprofit that was spun out of Merck uh, ten years ago, and our mission is to. Uh, look at the ways that data science uh, can be made more reliable in the life sciences, uh, primarily by focusing on how responsibly we can share data to support reliable claims and how representative the data and the claims are um, uh, so that we can begin to assess the ways that the non-representation, whether by sample size or by demographics or other elements, um, compromises the reliability of claims that are made in, in, in data science. So I wanted to start today by, by talking a little bit about where we really came from at SAGE and, and, and where our position fits inside the overall open science space. And, and I think at least for me, uh, my involvement came um, through the open access to research literature movement. Um, and there's a lovely uh, quote here about publish houses of brick, not houses of straw, uh, which I'll, I'll show that in just a second. But it's, it helps me think about the way that we have been doing life sciences in the United States, has, has, yeah, especially on the non-corporate side, has been about you know, applying to research funders, this is the NIH, um, who then give money to research institutions who employ uh, life scientists and informaticians who then write smaller and smaller papers. And this is really this concept of the papers of straw where you have, uh, you have a small amount of data, you have broad claims, um, you maybe have one or two claims in that paper that are actually really justifiable, but you try to make that as broad as possible. So you have more papers, right? less claims per paper, but broader impact claims per paper coming out of it. And frequently you'll have the same data set being whipped over and over and over again uh, to create more and more papers. And so whether you call this you know, p-hacking or other elements, um, it's kind of a feature of the way that we invest in the life sciences now. Uh, it's no longer a bug because we reward sort of depth and breadth of publication at a level where if you can basically keep your data private, reanalyze it, reanalyze it, reanalyze it, and get as many papers out of it, and in many cases, you'll get rewarded for that. And that has a long-term impact on science. Uh, because if we start to take the claims out of many such papers and concatenate them, um, the errors and the unreliability propagate. And so um, you know, we talk about massive incrementalism, which is that we give out lots and lots of grants and we publish lots and lots of papers and just for visualization of how many papers we're publishing on a year to year basis. It's a lot. No one could possibly read all of the literature that they need to be able to contemplate. And so I got into this under the idea that, that we need to be able to take these papers and turn them into computational um, objects. So I you know, got my start in the semantic web, uh, and actually you know, Keith Elliston and I worked together, you know, coming up on 20 years ago, um, precisely on the idea that you need to be able to compute on the research literature if you're going to be able to make reliable claims that come out of it. Um, but the impact of all of these unreliable claims is that it gets harder and harder and harder, especially with blockages to the research literature itself, to know whether or not, um, you know, where the weak links in a network analysis may be. And so this is that, that lovely paper, uh, the lovely uh, piece by, by William Kalin that I really like on this, which is that, you know, the amount of data and the number of claims, they're just going up and up and up and up. And we have not really dealt with that. And so this is where I got into open science and, and, and where I got into SAGE, you know, 10 years ago. And there's, there's a lot of work that's happening outside of SAGE here that I want to sort of recognize and honor first. 
so the Center for Open Science has been an incredible leader in, in addressing unreliability by saying, you should register and peer review right before you know what your results are. Um, so that you can't retrospectively adjust things. Um, you should pre-register trials and studies uh, before you get into it. So again, you can't reverse engineer in a way that hurts the reliability of the claim. So this has been happening um, in a very broad ecosystem. Um, it's happening uh, at the federal government level. So you know, before uh, uh, Joe Biden left uh, office, he really pushed this data sharing plan around uh, cancer, the cancer moonshot. Um, going back to 2013 to John Holdren's memorandum on expanding public access to the results of research. Um, so this was primarily interpreted as being about the, the, the literature, uh, but it says the data in the very first couple of sentences of, of what they're looking at. So the data is considered a first order result of research and it's increasingly being required that we share it. Uh, to address in many ways this unreliability problem, it's the biggest driver. There's not a lot of evidence that open science and data sharing will sort of magically make pharmaceutical discovery easy or cheap. There's a lot of evidence that open science will make science more reliable. Um, and this you know, continues through to the current administration. So this is the recent call from OSTP at the White House on uh, what are the desirable characteristics of repositories to manage and share these data. Um, I think there's an understanding that it's not just put it in Dropbox and you know, having a link on the internet doesn't sort of suffice. You need to be talking about is, are these data downloadable? Are they going to be computed in place? Um, do they need to store private data or PHI um, or do they not need to store those things? I mean, are you going to have something that's really open or something that's less open? Um, and then, you know, we also see movement at the institutional level saying we're not going to stand up for these journal aspects because there's an understanding that the costs are bad, the deals are bad, um, as well as the librarians knowing that they can do a much better job managing the information if they have the right to manage local copies effectively. So this is sort of the, the space SAGE comes out of. And so there's a lot of people working in the space. You know, we're not a publisher. Uh, we're not doing pre-registration and registered reports and those kinds of things. We're fundamentally a, a science organization. Uh, we have, you know, going back to, to when the org was formed out of Merck, um, we have a large group of computational scientists and systems biologists um, who do project work. And so when you think about, you know, how we get revenues as a nonprofit, part of that is through grants from the NIH, uh, part of that is through philanthropic, but a part of it is through doing actual service work is saying, we need to help people analyze data and help them get to claims that they can trust. And what we've learned over that decade is that, is that it's incredible how team science, uh, done technically enabled, can really move you towards this increase in reliability. But two of the key elements of that are being responsible so that you can share as much data as possible. Uh, but responsible also means not sharing it when you shouldn't or farther than you should. Uh, representative, which is saying, are we getting enough eyes on the data and with enough epistemic and other kinds of diversity of the kinds of eyes that are looking at, that, at those data to make sure that the claims that are coming out reflect consensus models or consensus benchmarks. And increasingly trying to think about where we can take representation beyond that, uh, but all in the service of can we actually draw claims out of data that we think are justifiable. So I'm going to walk through some of these elements, and 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 this is all relevant in the pandemic. I promise. Um, in fact, I would argue that uh, the pandemic has not fundamentally changed things with open science. It has simply accelerated those things, um, and I'll and I'll get with that in a second. So so what do we mean by responsible? And I'll start with. Um, mobile health, because mobile health is a field that doesn't have a lot of the built-in inertia of, you know, oncology or neurodegeneration or some of the other spaces that we work in. Um, it hasn't had the sort of lifespan to develop the institutional crust uh, that these other fields have developed. And we got into this moderately early in 2013 as we started thinking about, can we measure Parkinson's using no more than the phone? And so from a data generation perspective, we realized that you know, pretty easily we could test motor initiation, gait, uh, some vocalization and some memory just using the touchscreen, the microphone and the accelerometer on, on the device. And what's striking is if you make this jump away from measuring these sort of qualitatively uh, observationally, is you can radically increase the dimensionality of the data that you capture. So instead of going from a traditional measure like you know, how many taps did John have 
or on a scale of one to five, how was John's tapping, you get this vast increase in the dimensions that you can measure. And those, dimension, those dimensions are great, right? They let you start to look at invisible impacts under the previous measure of just number of taps because you know, on the left, we have a, a male individual. And what we see is that uh, here's number of taps, mean tapping, median tapping. Um, and so this is an individual where uh, before and after L-DOPA, we would have been able to see a clear benefit to the L-DOPA dose. This is a woman on the right. And so number of taps is right here in the middle. It's not something that's going to jump out uh, as the, the tapping test doesn't show benefit from the L-DOPA. But what we do see changing in the standard deviation, the range and the correlation um, is that this is someone who's, who's doing better at tapping um, from a, an accuracy perspective significantly than she was doing before the L-DOPA. So this is, an, this is a, an impact of the drug that would have been invisible that we can now make visible. Um, and it's complicated because here's, here's one individual over time, right? Day, every one of these is a day going left to right um, and a, a, an arrow going up and the length of that arrow indicates a day where the taps got better after L-DOPA. So you have a bottom dot before L-DOPA, a top dot after L-DOPA. So we can see that these are good days. These are days where the drug is working for whatever, you know, based on the definition of tapping. But here in the middle, we see chaos. We see bad days where the, there's the tapping gets worse after the drug. We see a lot of incomplete days. We see some outlier days, even where there's a benefit. And this is essentially a clinical hypothesis uh, that we would like to be able to dig to. What happened? What else happened in this person's life? Was their condition getting worse? Um, or were they doing the tapping test uh, while they were driving or while they were walking or while they were distracted by their kids? Um, because to get into this, you start to have so much data that it's, it's really hard to, to use tr traditional clinical informatics tools. You've got to start using consumer grade data analytics systems. Um, and this, as we got into it, we realized that we needed to share the data. Um, that doing this just the way that we did it, we wanted to actually have the methods development bootstrap off of our data because um, even after having the data by ourselves for a year, we still didn't really know what all the best methods were. Um, and we wanted to be able to share these data broadly so we could do that. So what's the governance for that? How do we do that responsibly? It starts with informed consent. Um, and if you're gonna do informed consent on a device, we have to be very honest about the way that people share, the, the, the way that people read on screens. Um, so this is what's known typically as the F pattern. Uh, it's one of the two or three patterns that are the most prevalent as people read text on screens versus in print. And so this is done through eye gaze fixation tracking and saccade analysis. Um, and what you see is people don't read the whole page on a screen, not the way that they do in print. And this is true uh, in, uh, in, in web text. It's also true in legal documents like we're dealing with here. So we have to build for that. Um, we have to build for the fact that people scan. And so the same eye gaze fixation and saccade tracking studies indicate that people maybe read one out of three words on a screen just by speed of reading compared to what they read in print. Um, and so we have to account for both the visual flow of the eye across the page and for the fact that for some reason we seem to scan when we're looking at pixels compared to looking at print. So we, we cannot assume that just giving a traditional legal document will result in the reading of that document by the individual. Um, and even if they try to read it, their eyes may be fooling them and skipping ahead the way that they read. On top of that, we have a cultural element, which is that we accept legal documents we don't read on the internet all the time. Um, we have to click OK on privacy policies in terms of service every time we download apps, every time we visit websites that use cookies. And so we have become culturally conditioned to just simply click our way through. So if we're going to enroll people in a study like, like this Parkinson's study, and we want to share their data broadly enough to do validated methods development, we have a pretty serious obligation to meet the responsible uh, aspect of this, of this uh, ontology. So what we developed at SAGE are, are these consent design patterns. So we have uh, on the left, you see the screen layout. Uh, so the layout that includes lots of white space, it has the, the, the icon, the headline, the subheadline, the learn more and the next. So there's evidence from web journalism and other kinds of, uh, other kinds of content providers on the internet that this mixture of an on-task picture, a headline and a subheadline, slows down eye gaze fixation to a, sp a speed that is much closer to print, if not equivalent to print, than, than not using this kind of approach. Interestingly, if the icon is not on-task, if the photograph is irrelevant, you don't get the benefit. 
So the theory is there's some sort of cognitive processing that happens as you try to connect the icon to the text that you see that slows you down and gets you to think about it. And so this is a, this is a methodology that we developed and it actually works pretty well. You can convey relatively complex issues. You can tier or nest more information at that learn more screen. Um, you can turn the icon into a video. Uh, if you don't want to put information back on a, on, a, on a hidden screen, you can do an awful lot with this design. And what you build is essentially a, a user interface to the legal document because you know people aren't going to read the legal document as carefully as you want them to. And because in an e-consent, you don't have a clinical research coordinator sitting there to help uh, with any questions. Because we'd like to share the data broadly for these methods uses, um, we decided not to do that um, as a default. We wanted to make that opt-in only. So uh, this is a screen that's presented to participants in this study and other studies that we run. Uh, we do not set a default. So it is, it is set originally as, as blank and you have to choose one of these two options, either to only share my data with Sage and its partners on the protocol or to share the data with Sage and its partners and qualified researchers worldwide. And uh, you get a second little consent loop of, of, of interface content around this issue of what's a qualified researcher, because that's gonna be something that's widely available in this context. And uh, for what it's worth, about uh, two in three participants elect to share broadly with qualified researchers worldwide. And so what that means is that, that by designing this thing from the beginning, from data ingress through the consent mechanism, through data egress through these sharing mechanisms, is a responsible way to crowdsource data for methods development that lets us run a challenge. And that computational challenge lets us peer review methods in a non-publication form. And so this is a really interesting application of open science for me because what it's doing is showing a different analytic route um, to validation or at least um, um, evaluation of the claims that come out of the kinds of algorithms and feature extraction tools uh, that you can build on these kind of data, which is a great thing to do when you don't have, uh, as a field, a basis for what's a meaningful, valid algorithm, what it needs to look like. Um, and and you know, this process works pretty well, as it turns out, that you can enroll a lot of people. Um, you, uh, and we could, I could give an entire hour long talk about how hard it is to retain and engage those people, but you can at least get them in the door and doing some initial work relatively easy with these kinds of approaches. Now, as again, open science organization, we want to distribute and give away the ways that we did this. So the first thing we did was deposit as much of this as we could in GitHub. So this is hundreds of, uh, hundreds of icons that are open source uh, or public domain, uh, as well as templates. So uh, the protocols that we filed, um, the, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a generalized version of the protocol or the template that's designed for customization, um, user interface, templates that are in designer friendly formats like Photoshop or Figma. So that it's really easy to grab these kinds of things and bootstrap up your own kind of study. And this is really important because people may be willing to do ethical things, but they don't want to do much more than do a stack overflow query to find them. So by working with Apple, we were able to push this sort of methodology uh, into the research kit framework by working with the open, open source research stack equivalent on Android. So we've now got this visual consent baked into two of the, the two major stacks that you use to develop, the iPhone and the Android one. Um, and so this gets at how, you know, if you take responsibility seriously, you can do an awful lot um, when it comes to, to sharing data, even if it's not open, right? What I described as data that sits under a data use agreement is downloaded by these qualified researchers who then generate and send their algorithms back. They're not supposed to retransfer those data. And we have to work on making sure they don't retransfer those data. But we can then share broadly, but not to the whole world as a way of mitigating the risk of sharing the data. Uh, we can de-identify those data, we can only share certain kinds of data, but we're inherently trying to create this argument that there's a risk-benefit equilibrium in running challenges or, or letting qualified researchers download low-risk data like these are um, as a way to, to build a responsible commons around this research study. So uh, reliable is, is probably the most important thing we do. So I wanted to jump to that next because the, in many ways that, that Parkinson's dream challenge was an example of a way to assess reliability of data coming out of response, uh, res the reliability of claims coming out of responsibly shared data. 
Um, but there's a whole batch of ways to do data sharing to do reliability work. And so I, I, I try to contrast, it's not just open and closed. Uh, and by open, I mean things that are on the web that are downloadable under an open source tool without registration. And by closed, I mean the vast majority of, of, of sort of pairwise one-to-one -one or lab-to-lab -lab collaboration that happens where people just share data sub Rosa through Dropbox and what have you. But if we start saying, can we take that kind of pairwise collaboration and move it a step up in terms of the accessibility? So how, how much of that data is available and to how many people? But maybe we need to back away a little on how much freedom each individual member has. Because in a closed deal, right, we don't really know how much freedom each side of the pairwise deal has. But in a collaboration, typically to get the benefits of a collaboration, everyone has to give a little in order to get something. So you'll have to maybe give and use someone else's preferred cloud platform or give and use someone else's preferred metadata schema. Um, but in return, ideally, you get to go from having a sample size of N to a sample size of collaboration times N. Um, and this is a really powerful move up the spectrum, right, from a traditional closed deal. And it's, it's a lot of what NIH funds these days. But first, I'm going to give an example of one that we put together um, sort of ourselves with some friends which is around colorectal cancer subtyping. So here we have four papers uh, published in a, in a very uh, rapid succession, um, each of which uh, is doing a colorectal cancer subtype uh, analysis, uh, but each of which has a different outcome because they've used a different population and a different uh, analytic approach. Uh, but four papers in a very short period of time. And so uh, Stephen Friend, who was our president at the time, Justin Ganey, who leads our computational oncology work, spent a lot of time talking to each of these groups and more because the, the group expanded and saying, you know, rather than you know, group A analyzing data one to create subtype A1, what if everyone in the group got to analyze 6N, right? Instead of just their data, analyzing 6X their amount of data. And in return for that, everyone can write their own paper on their own data if they want, but the collective retains the right to publish the consensus subtypes paper. Um, and this is a joinable club. Anyone that's doing colorectal cancer subtyping can join and add their data to it. And it's an ongoing benchmark that's really quite powerful in the field. And so what you've got here is a case where the collaboration is a joinable club, right? So it's more liberal than closed, but it's definitely not open. But what it's publishing and making open and really available is this consensus benchmark model, which is really useful now for the field by setting a floor that says, you know, can you meet or beat these consensus benchmarks? And if so, you need to be able to talk about that. And if not, you need to be able to talk about that. Right. Sandbox is another uh, model that we're seeing happening again and again. And a, a different phrase for this might be um, trusted research environment, which I've heard from Tim Hubbard uh, in the UK and others. And there's a couple of ways to do a sandbox. One would be a sandbox where um, you have a pretty aggressive process for uh, requiring people to work in it. Uh, and another would be one where you've actually literally you can't even download the data. You've got to go compute on it in place. But either way, the sandbox sort of goes up the tier because it's frequently required by the funder that you participate in the sandbox. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's a really interesting model here. So one version of this would be the Accelerating Medicines Partnership Program. So uh, this is happening in a variety of diseases through the NIH. It's, it's public-private co-investment. We're involved in the uh, AMP AD, which is for Alzheimer's. And so that specifically involves NIH, uh, 10 biopharmas and a bunch of nonprofit orgs um, that are working on, can we basically diversify the way that we find Alzheimer's targets um, uh, with the idea that if, if multiple labs with multiple methodologies arrive at the same target, then the odds of those targets being uh, sort of false positives um, uh, goes down somewhat because you're, you're defeating the noise of any individual laboratory's method by getting that epistemic diversity by integrating them into a sandbox. So in order to do this, especially the part we work on, which is target discovery, we have to coordinate the, the early phase uh, insights into a shared model. Each of the labs does their own thing, but again, to get that collaboration, they've got to give up and work in a collective technical environment, which is Synapse at SAGE. Um, we have a team of curators and data wranglers and computational neuroscientists who then work on making sure those data are harmonized um, and, and, and very effectively shareable. Uh, and then there's a, there's a resharing back out to do the validation. And then uh, one of the interesting pieces is that we can then 
transition out of this sandbox to a public uh, or an open data environment where we publish the processed information, the cleaned information, the engineered data out to a data portal where you can see things like this is the wall of targets that are emerging out of these. And you can see very quickly, you know, VGF, vascular growth factor, came out of three different uh, laboratory environments, three different, uh, three different of the collaborators each found this independently. And you can then browse down to all the relevant data just by clicking on it. You can get all the network analysis, um, you can access the code, you can even access some of the physical tools that were used to generate this through the AMP AD data portal. And this turns out to be really important. So why is reliability important? Well, because the NIH wants to actually fund to this. So this was all phase one AMP AD. Phase two AMP AD is about drug discovery. And so uh, you wanna be able to validate these targets now in an open, um, in an open dis drug discovery phase um, because these are felt to be targets that are high priority for validation. So it starts to be this interesting way where the NIH is leveraging this approach which sort of hedges against the unreliability, unreliability of individual labs and hedges in favor of the reliability of the collective coming out of it as a form of diversity, and so you know, cognitive diversity, uh, to get towards reliability. But I've used, the, I've used the word diversity a couple of times, and I wanna sort of talk about what does that mean in terms of representation? Because it's one thing to have epistemic or cognitive diversity on these things, uh, but frequently that means uh, simply getting more white people uh, involved um, and more of the people who are already powerful, that's clearly not what is behind all of the goals of open science. And so representation is a key piece of this. And there's a couple of different places where we work uh, in areas that are aiming at increasing representation. Probably the biggest one is the All of Us Research Program. So this is a, a large, uh, extremely large, federally funded uh, decade plus uh, cohort study. Think of it as the Framingham cohort for the 21st century. Um, that has a mandate to overrepresent the underrepresented in biomedical research um, so that anything that is built out of this large public resource um, will ideally have less algorithmic bias um, than those that are coming out of the smaller things that don't have representation as a core value. Um, so, you know, if you go to the, uh, the research portal, uh, you can look at the data snapshots. That's what these are. So you can see sort of the, the scale of enrollment in the project at this point. And from a representation perspective, uh, the project has met its goals to date. So uh, more than half the cohort are, re are racial and ethnic minorities, um, and over 80% of the overall cohort meets at least one variable that qualifies as underrepresented in biomedical research. And the idea behind this is, again, let's share this data as responsibly as possible. If we can make it representative, then we want to share the data responsibly to drive methods and insight development on these representative data. And so the process there is, 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 is this sort of sandbox environment, right? But unlike AMP, where the parties involved are sort of working in a private collaboration in a, in a mandated sandbox, this is an open sandbox. And so to create an open sandbox, you have to reduce some of the freedoms of the people who use the sandbox. And so the big freedom that's reduced in the All of Us sandbox is you can't download the data. You have to go compute in the trusted research environment as a modeler. So that's the idea is that you can go there as a modeler, do exploratory data science, but you're not going to be able to exfiltrate data in a way that would let you redistribute it, that would let you per perhaps pass it on from party A to party B to party C to creating the Cambridge Analytica style of data breach and, and, and trust violation that we're dealing with. Um, but all we've done here is increase the representation on, on the, those enrolling. Um, we haven't talked about how do we actually increase the representation in those who are able to ask questions. And so this is something that all of us is still working on. We don't have an answer for it yet. Um, you, you can go uh, and apply through the research hub uh, for exploratory access, but for the most part, it's going to need an ERA Commons ID. Uh, and so at Sage, we have a we have a side project we're looking at uh, that is led by Megan Doer on the governance team and Jun Ho Yu from the University of Washington, uh, which is about how do we develop capacity for community-led big data research. And so this is a project that is fundamentally about um, can we move from simply doing a better job of enrolling to marrying responsible data sharing and some form of, of, of big data research training that is uh, based in communities, grounded in those communities, so that they can ask the questions that, that matter the most to them, as opposed to trying to give money to elite researchers 
to ask questions that are relevant to those communities and then uh, double pay the publishers to open up the articles. That if we can leverage these responsible sharing mechanisms, that increasing the representation of those who ask the questions um, is actually the next phase of, of success here. And this is a project that if anyone's interested, uh, I would welcome uh, anyone that wants to talk about this one. I think it's the most exciting thing in many ways that we've got burning right now at Sage. Um, I think it's really important to note that sometimes things are closed because they need to be. Uh, and sometimes data are restricted because they need to be. Um, and that could be, you know, because of HIPAA or regulatory concerns. It could be closed because of trade secrets. You know, from a responsibility, a reliability, and a representation perspective, I want to zoom in on uh, people that have been hurt uh, by, by data sharing. So this is uh, uh, by, by Dr. Nani Bagarison, who's a, uh, uh, both a, a doctor and a, an ethicist. And this is a great piece about the impact of the Hapasupai case on genetic research. So um, the Hapasupai tribe in 2004 discovered that their DNA, which was collected for type 2 diabetes, had been shared. It had been reused, right? This is, you know, uh, I'm sure that people involved thought they were doing this in a way that was an open science thing. Uh, and what happened is that, that some of that secondary analysis um, broke with the cosmology of the tribe, of the nation. And so uh, one of the questions that I think we have to ask ourselves as open science people or open science advocates is, can we share while we protect? And, and it's important to frame it as can, not how do, uh, because we have to be open to the idea that not all data can be shared and not all data should be shared. Um, but I wanted to call out a specific piece of the abstract here, which is if researchers and IRBs do not change their practices in light of this case, these populations will likely continue to be excluded from a majority of research studies and left with less access to resource and potential benefit from genetic research participation. The answer to this is not, um, let's just get broad consent for these populations, right? Uh, which is typically how researchers react is to sort of work around the problem, get broad consent, de-identify the samples so that you sort of break that connection and just go do the research. Um, I can tell you as an advocate for good informed consent that this is one of the best pieces you'll ever read about it by Ellen Clayton, which is that informed consent has an unbearable burden placed on it by the modern uh, uh, biomedical informatics system. There's too many possible reuses. The harms are so multivariate and so hard to trace that, that just saying, you know, consent better, even if we do the kinds of UX that I showed earlier, it just doesn't cut it. Um, and for those of us who are, who are not in populations that have been actively hurt by biomedical research, um, we have economic harms, at least in the United States, we have to think about. Um, it is still legal to discriminate against Americans for their long-term care and disability uh, in educational context and in certain employment contexts based on their DNA. And so uh, we need to be very careful to think about, you know, can we share while we protect? And so one of the other models we've developed, which is, you know, and it's, it's both new and old, like a lot of things in computing, uh, it looks a lot like time sharing in the old days, because what you're talking about is, can we build these alternative models to make crowdsourcing possible while maintaining the data restrictions and enclosure necessary to protect the people represented in those data? And so we call this model to data. If the sandbox is the, if, if the sort of, if the all of us is the sandbox where the modeler visits the data, um, this is an even more protected model where the model, only the model goes to the data. And so the idea is instead of, you know, giving challenge participants like in that Parkinson's challenge, a copy of the data that they then download process locally and just send their predictions back for scoring, we act as a data steward. And so we receive the data from somebody like in, uh, we have one was a digital mammography challenge. We received nearly a million mammograms that were available for analysis, but not consented for sharing. So we were able to enter into a pairwise contract, host those data as a steward, generate a synthetic data set to allow modelers to train on and containerize their models. And then they send us those models as submissions we run them on the actual validation data sets, the real data, not the synthetic data, and then publish the scoring and the leaderboards and, and the benchmarks. So this starts to get out a way where we can keep an air gap between the data and the modeler, but still maintain a way to do exploratory research if somebody wants to. And so, you know, the idea here is that these are all a suite of processes. Open science is this spectrum of sharing. It's not just license your data or say it's fair. There's this entire system 
technical, cultural, scientific practice around it that's required to make the use of the data uh, useful. Uh, to the actual scientists who are trying to draw claims out of the data. Just posting it and thinking that's going to be transformative is not something that we've seen a lot of evidence for in our own work yet. So um, I promised to be uh, somewhat COVID relevant. So what I want to propose is that open science, particularly governance of open science, um, is fundamentally a, a, a form of management discipline. Um, and it's something that we often relegate to lawyers or to junior staff uh, or to simple open source licenses. But I, I believe that if we treat it as a first order management discipline, that we can get some real breakthroughs. And so I wanna talk about a project that we've been working on in COVID that's an example and sort of an existence proof of that, of that concept. So if we say, fine, I've given you this theoretical framework, but what does it mean for me? If I wanna build a new commons, is it an intervention that makes things better, faster or cheaper? So uh, we all know that we're in a pandemic. We all know that governance can, can hamstring things in a pandemic if it's not done right. So this is uh, Megan Doer again from SAGE and Jennifer Wagner, uh, our dear friend from Geisinger, uh, wrote this piece where they analyzed how the Seattle flu study was actually blocked from uh, repeatedly from reanalyzing their nasal swabs for COVID. Um, and you know, went and did the right thing, went to their local IRB, got the emergency research exemptions, you know, shut down by the feds, shut down by the state in a way that really delayed the response. So doing things in a pandemic, it's, it's, it's not a guarantee that, that the pandemic will wave away uh, research restrictions, um, even when they need to be, right? Um, what's clear is that, that pandemics and other areas really make it complicated to create a commons or to reuse or to reshare, because in some cases there might be some uh, laws and regulations that are trying to ease those burdens to respond, but in other areas, those laws uh, may be in conflict. And so the question is, if you can think about what I've just shown and say, does this, does this framework let us rapidly design data resources for the kinds of uses that we intend them for? So SAGE is, is, has been a part of the uh, CD2H, the Center for Data to Health, which is an NCATS CTSA uh, uh, program community support organization run by Dr. Melissa Handel at OHSU. Uh, and thanks to Ken and Jinji at, at NCATS. Um, and then also a lot of what I'm going to talk about is Justin uh, Gane at SAGE here. Uh, so this is a group that is, is, is aimed to serve all the CTSA program hubs. And so the question was, you know, what can we do um, in COVID, given that we have this CD2H architecture, we have the CTSA program hubs, and what we keep hearing are these questions over and over again, uh, that we'd like to be able to have some standardizable queries, right? So um, how's time on a ventilator affected by remdesivir? And ideally the ability to edit those, so you can say swap out ventilator and swap out remdesivir, so they become variables. But at the same time we heard, um, well, in patients under 60, you know, could I do exploratory analysis on those data to figure out where the interesting patterns are? These are very different problems. They require very different approaches, even though they should run on the exact same data. Um, and then also, this is sort of the unbearable lightness of, of the pandemic is, can you do it in less than a month? Can NIH be the data steward? Not an easy, simple nonprofit like SAGE. And can it be uh, FISMA moderate and FedRAMP compliant from the start? So small task. And so what's come out of this is the N3C, the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, uh, which is a service of CD2H to the CTSAs and then, and then on out. Um, and so what we've got here is a, is a uh, fundamentally is, is multiple of those governance models I showed at the same time. So what we have is a federated query model, right, which you see where the questions are actually aggregated out technically uh, and the results are aggregated and sent back. Um, this is something that even you know, that is relatively simple uh, to use and requires relatively light touch governance in the sense of who can do, who can run a federated query. For the centralized analytics, the exploratory research, um, we we are going to adopt a, a pretty clear a trusted research environment sandbox model, no data download, uh, but you'll be able to go in and get row level access to the data to do this kind of exploratory and collaborative. Uh, building, testing, and refinement of algorithmic classifiers and finding novel associations. Um, and then on top of that, we're going to have a synthetic data set, uh, which is generated out of the same data that's in that limited data set, that row level limited data set, that will be downloadable and usable so that you can do local modeling and exploration and then bring that to the secure enclave. Um, 
all of this ties into a pretty complicated ecosystem that makes the data usable because we're talking about data coming in from PCORnet and Trinetics and various versions of OMOP. They all have to get ingested, harmonized. Um, there have to be collaborative analytics models that are sitting there pre-formed so that users can come in and use those. And we have to be able to give attribution and credit back uh, to the collective as well as to those who come up with the discoveries. And what you see then at the end from a governance perspective is we have this top level line where uh, we're trying to deal with the regulatory paperwork, the IRB filing, the data transfer agreement, other necessary approvals, um, as well as the egress mechanisms for the synthetic data, rights to do federated query and entree into the enclave to do exploratory research under a data use agreement. So this starts with, you know, Melissa on March 18th, uh, sending this, this email out to the PI list from that. Um, the tools we have available are, uh, for Sage's perspective, we have contractual patterns, the qualified researcher process. Thanks to the Smart IB program, we have reliance agreements and all sorts of, of institutional regulatory ethics collaborations already in place. And because of the federal demonstration partnership, we have the contractual patterns that let different institutions uh, come to economic collaboration legally under the government. Chris Shute at Hopkins volunteered to, to be the single IRB for this and shepherded that protocol through. Christine Suver, for, who leads the governance group at SAGE, drafted the DTAs and the DUAs, the data transfer and data use agreements. Um, the, uh, the standard operating procedures around attribution and credit are in, are, are, are in process now. But because we had these mental models in place and we have all of these existing standard management toolkits available, this is our time frame. So from 3.18 to 5.1, single IRB joinable protocol approved. And as of yesterday, 37 institutional signatories and bits are already flowing into the, into the repository. And so this is what you can do if you think of governance as a management discipline and not as an afterthought or something that's the realm of lawyers. And what's emerging is this entire suite of tools that you can use, even in a pandemic, to rapidly stand up uh, data resources that are intended to be broadly available. And what's interesting about the N3C to me is the three routes. So rather than trying to make one product that meets all the needs of the, of the potential user population, we have the federated query product, the synthetic data product, and the limited data set for exploration product, which each have their own regimes, but they're coming out of the same data pipeline. Uh, and the value of that is that we can have different access tiers for those different kinds uh, of tools, um, which get, lets us give access to a very broad group without sort of hamstringing the expert's ability to do exploratory work. Uh, and if this is of interest, uh, here's where you can find uh, the, the website. If CD2H is a place you've not engaged with, I would encourage you to do that. There's yet another Slack uh, that you might join to do such a thing, but it is a great place to engage in this sort of emerging hybridization of how do you take the cloud and governance to do the responsible, reliable, representative data sharing to make the claims coming out of this as strong as possible? So I'll stop in a second and, and we can do Q&A. Um, if I leave you with one thing, I, I wanna leave you with this, that it's not about open versus closed. If we're gonna build these commons, there's not gonna be one commons uh, that comes from one open data license. Um, I wish that that were the case. You know, I spent a long time pushing for that, but that's just not how it is. What we're gonna have is something that looks a lot more like um, a variety of commonses uh, that are managed in ways that are locally relevant and, and, and where the aspects of those managements come, come from those communities, including the people represented in the data. But if we don't make the data itself, those artifacts usable, and if we don't embed them in a technical commons that enables their analysis, we're gonna miss a lot of the opportunities that are there at the theoretical level for, for data sharing. Um, I showed you this, I wanna leave you with these two questions on this graph, which is who gets to decide which model is chosen here and who has the power to change if the wrong structure is chosen. Um, this is typically not the individuals who are represented in the data. Uh, it is typically the most powerful or the best funded institution and so as we do these sorts of collaborations, we need to contemplate that power and find ways to normalize, equalize, and make that much more equitable and inclusive. Um, because what we don't want is a world where all of these commonses look exactly the same. Their diversity is their strength. Um, and this in many ways comes from Eleanor Ostrom's work. So uh, Dr. Ostrom was a political scientist. She won the Nobel in economics 
for her work that demonstrated over and over again in setting after setting, qualitative, quantitative, lab work, field work, that groups of people figure out how to solve their resource sharing problems. That the tragedy of the commons was a thought experiment that's not supported by data in the vast majority of cases. So as we think about building research commons, it's not about building a research commons, it's about building the research commonses. And, uh, and I'll, I'll leave you at the last with, with her eight principles on how to build one. And maybe you'll see some echoes of in what I've talked about of these eight principles. Um, the most important ones to me, you know, uh, that are often not um, contemplated are ensuring that those who are affected by the rules can participate in modifying the rules. That's really, 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 really important. Um, low cost methods for dispute resolution is really, really important and using graduated uh, sanctions for people who violate, because most people don't violate because they're bad, they violate because they didn't remember the rule. And so you don't wanna start by nuking people, you wanna start by slapping them on the wrist, but you have to be willing to graduate up to nuking them if they continue to behave badly, because if you don't, that's how you create the tragedy of the commons. So uh, my, my whole concept here is, is, is let's embrace the diversity required to share data responsibly. Let's talk about the relationship of that diversity to the technical standards and platforms that we need to analyze data in group environments, which is very real. This is not an, an, an argument for a thousand metadata standards blooming or a thousand data formats blooming. Um, it's an argument for recognizing that there are these repeatable patterns in governance space that look like model to data and sandboxes and collaborations. And we can design from a management perspective, systems that make it relatively easy to stand up ethical, legal, but scientifically innovative and supporting research environments to get more eyes on more data faster. And with that, I'll stop. Please feel free to email me. This is my Twitter handle. And thank you again to the organizers for having me today. Thank you, John. That was fantastic. So I'll open this up for questions. I know um, Doug McFadden has a question. And he is in the panelist box, so he can't put it in the Q&A um, question. So, Doug, I think you can unmute yourself and just ask the question. Hello, can you guys hear me? We can, yes. Great, thank you. Um, John, uh, several slides back when you were talking about the N3C approach um, that involved, uh, I think you, the slide represented both uh, an approach for federated queries and also for the enclave for um, the uh, line level data. Um, and N3C has been talking a lot about that enclave. The federated queries, I haven't heard a lot from N3C about. Do you know what mechanism they're planning on using for that? Um, I do not. Uh, I'm, I'm co-chairing the governance and partnership work stream. And so I have, I've been busy with that, to be blunt. Uh, so I haven't participated in those calls. I will say that all of the work streams are openly available. Okay. So what I will do is uh, I, I'll, I'll talk to Justin Ganey, who's co-chairing the collaborative analytics and Melissa, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to the, uh, to the chat with an answer. Great, thank you. Great. Other, other questions, comments? Yes. I'll, I'll keep talking, but I figured you guys might want to ask some questions. Yeah, I don't see the question box. If anybody from the, oh, here we go. Uh, what are your thoughts about speed of modification of a given uh, commons in high pressure situation like the COVID pandemic um, with lots of collaborators who should naturally have a say in it? knowing that especially academic institutions tend to be um, a slow, slow about that, sort of consensus driven. That's a great question. Um, that's so modifying a commons is one of the hardest questions you've got, right? Who has the right to modify it and when? Um, because in many cases you wind up replicating the problems of democracy, which is a kind of a tough place to be when you're just trying to do science. Um, so, so, you know, my, my general bias is that, um, it, it sort of depends on what you're trying to do and, and what your data looks like. So if you're gonna be doing a clinical research study with a population, um, then you need to have some form of participation from that population before you modify, particularly if you're gonna increase or decrease the amount of sharing. Uh, like if you're gonna transition from one of those structures to another one, 
Um, I think that that's, that's something you want to have the participants involved in. Um, you know, to me, you sort of have a, a loose stakeholder group that is you know, the funders of the research, uh, the PIs doing the research, representative uh, of those who are represented in the data is sort of the ideal mix. Um, but it's not sort of, you know, a, a group vote where everyone who is a participant or a line level analyzer you know, gets to vote raw, right? Those are pretty easy to game. Um, and so, you know, most of the ones that I'm in have adopted what I would call sort of a rough consensus approach where you try to get, um, you try to get to a rough consensus. You don't try to get to unanimity on everything. Um, you have to create a culture that sort of disagree and commit uh, inside that, which means you've got to get the, whatever the answer is, is got to be close enough that someone, even if they disagree with it, can still commit to it and back it. Um, it's probably the least formalized element of, of, of the stuff that I showed, right? So the, the building blocks, the contractual language, the user interface elements, the consent documents, that's the easy stuff. Um, the hard stuff is the process that requires human implementation where all the design patterns in the world don't help you decide when to change from one to another. And so that's, that's probably one of the less understood elements of these is what works best and when. And, and I've got some heuristics, but I don't have a lot of data. Other questions, comments from the group? Okay. Okay. Well, this is this is really terrific, um, John. You know, I've been working in this space for you know going on twenty five years, and data sharing is. Um, I don't know why it's the hardest thing. It's the hardest part of, of what we've I've, I've done in my entire career, and it doesn't seem to get any easier. So your talk was really fantastic and common sense and 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 good. So thank you. It's, it's, and and we'll be publishing a green paper relatively soon that 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 describes it. We call it a green paper because it's not a white paper yet. It still needs uh, growth and, and age. But part of what we want to do is, 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 is create a conversation around that that says, what are we missing? What structures are we missing? What sort of standard design elements and patterns can we grab? Because, you know, we want everyone to be able to do things as fast and, as, uh, and the way that we do it. Um, and so the, the more we can discover and promote these elements that we don't make ourselves, like the Federal Demonstration Partnership, like Smart IRB, right, those pieces, if you start to put them together with intent, it's data sharing is easier than it seems from a governance perspective. I would say it is harder than it seems from a technical and a curation perspective. Um, and so that's, that's been one of the, the, the lessons I've taken away from my decade with Sage is, is just how much harder it is to make the data usable to a third party than we want it to be. That's terrific. Any other questions? Okay, Gil has raised his hand. Um, Thomas or somebody, can we unmute Gil? Gil Ullman? I can do it, Des. Gil. Gilbert, loud, okay. All right, Gil, can um, we talk? Okay, now I think you can hear me. Yes. Yes? Yes. So John, I just, it's Gil Omen. I wanna thank you very much for a very energetic and informative talk. You've been in leadership on these issues for a long time. I think today's topic about this 4CE uh, consortium around COVID is quite a good example of many of the features you highlighted. It is a totally voluntary operation. It started with a, uh, pretty clear statement of purpose, which is always desirable and certainly subject to modification, especially collaborative modification. But it's better than just saying, send us data or, or um, let's collect data without having a sense of real purpose. And in this case, urgency. The capacity to, uh, under Zach's leadership and a very strong team in Boston, to mobilize people around the US and Europe was driven by the availability of the I2B2 platform, which you know extremely well. So I, I think that's all uh, 
about trying to suggest to you that you have a emerging but quite promising, maybe really already very good model for some of the points you just made. With your comments about um, human subjects review and IRBs, I was the uh, PI for many years of a project called uh, CARAT, beta carotene and retinal efficacy trial to, to try to prevent lung cancers and premature cardiovascular deaths in high risk individuals, smokers, former smokers, and asbestos exposed workers. And one of the innovations of that long project was to uh, bring together the seven major institutions, each one of whom of course had its own editorial board called the Human Subjects Review Panel, and uh, to work with the NCI, National Cancer Institute, and each institution to agree that we should have a templated um, informed consent document across the institutions and that we should have a single point of approval that each of the institutions would agree to respect after having a large hand in its design and governance and content. And we published this in the journal called Clinical Control Clinical Trials in 2002. And it became a feature of um, NCI and IH policy. So I think innovation in governance and innovation in data sharing and collaborative or sandbox research uh, has a useful track record and certainly needs to grow on the kind of uh, comments you've made today have put us on an even better path. Thanks very much. Thanks, Gil. Um, you know, it, 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 one of the interesting things about this is I say that governance doesn't scale very well, but it certainly seems to rhyme because the same batches of solutions I think are in play. And what's different now is, the, is if we sort of embrace some diversity right, in the commons is that we form, if, but, but then we think about how do I, I2B2 and some of the backbench, you know, Transmart, how, how do these architectures allow for two commonses to then merge or form a, a, a collaboration later? But there's actually a way to start generating network effects by having these, you know, the, the, the small number of technical platforms and technical systems that we need support a large number of commonses that then can make uh, agreements to, to merge with each other or federate with each other. And it's this bottom up way to start getting interoperability that is project centered. And as you know, as you noted, hypothesis or problem statement centered, um, which has been you know, something I've learned at Sage is that starting from, you have to solve a specific problem. Even if you want to make a general thing, it's got to actually solve some real problems for real people. Right. It's an incredibly powerful forcing function for governance. And, and I think for technology and scientific practice as well. And so, you know, can we take these things that 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 you know the NIH is invested in, like you know these kinds of these kinds of innovations that have been out there? Can we assemble them? Can we make them a discipline, a professional field whose job it is to make it possible to do interoperable research at scale? Because um, that that's what I think we do in governance at Sage that other governance groups don't do, is that we think that's our job, right? Is is to is is to enable that interoperable research in the cloud at scale. Um, and, and, and the pieces are there, right? There's not always willpower. There's not always urgency, as you point, <laughs> but, but the pieces are there and have been there. And a lot of what Sage is doing is just reifying them, formalizing them and labeling them. Very good. It's terrific. Well, thank you so much, John. This was, this was a, a, a terrific uh, keynote and we really, really appreciate your time. And uh, I know this will be uh, on our website and, and many people will take advantage of it. So thank you very much. Thank you. So now we're going to be uh, breaking for lunch, but I think Rudy Potenzone is going to, as uh, for the few people who want to stare at their computer while while we're at lunch, um, it's going to uh, talk a second about our um, virtual poster session. Rudy, are you there? See it? Okay. So on the website, I do have like a table of contents on the posters. It's uh, under this tab called View Posters. We've just got all the posters that we have. We have 11 posters. Thanks for the poster authors for putting them here. So if you just want a quick overview, they're all, they're all here with the authors and the um, uh, abstract. 
take a quick look, but the, the real thing that you want to do is uh, jump to the Slack channel. Now on the Slack channel, we have, um, this is the foundation Slack. Uh, again, from the website, you can join if you don't already. Um, um, this is on the other screen. Okay, sorry about that. So again, in the foundation Slack channel, you'll see a, uh, a channel and on Slack, there's a channel called Poster Session and all the posters are loaded here. These are all PDFs, I believe, and you can download them and look at them. If you click them, I think you get a nice readable size of each poster, which is very nice. Uh, and then each poster has a thread created. So there's a, a thread for each poster that then brings up a, a thread window on the side here, which you can write comments, questions, whatever. Uh, and then the authors are going to be monitoring these so that you can uh, go over and you know, give you answers and you can have an interactive session. So the hope here is that we can have a nice interactive session on all of these and the, um, uh, we can, you know, uh, not as good as walking around and looking at the posters with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine in your hand, but at least you have a chance to, you know, open up the, the posters, take a look, and then uh, ask questions of the, of the authors. Uh, so we just wanted to highlight that for you. Uh, they're all here. There are 11. Uh, if you've got a poster all that you want to throw in, we can add it easily. So I just encourage you to take a look. Uh, look at the posters if you can. And um, please uh, interact with the authors, ask questions, um, whatever. We will leave this up. This is, um, this will, you know, we'll, we will certainly leave this open through the end of June. You know, so um, if you want to come take a look, a number of the talks have a poster uh, related to their talk. So, you know, for uh, for example, the I2B2 um, roadmap, uh, there's a poster for the I2B2 roadmap for the Transmart roadmap, and you can take a look at these uh, at, your, at your leisure. That's all I want to say. Um, please take a look at the Slack and um, make use of it if you can.